And I muted all. We're going to go on and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the first computer science seminar for the fall semester. We have the privilege of having with us today the members of CADS, and they are going to share uh, some of their research plans for the newly uh, authorized and funded Center for Applied da Data Science. Uh, data science is really an expanding and explosive area, and it, the beauty of it is that it spans so many different disciplines. And so at this time, I'm going to turn the seminar over to the director of the center, Dr. Deb. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Let's give me a few minutes to put up the slide. Can you all see my slide? Is everyone muted? Yes, yeah, we can see you. Yes. yes, we can see you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Dr. Jones, uh, for inviting uh, me and the other CATS fellow to attend the seminar. This has been a privilege. Um, this is my home department, so I'm so thankful that we can start the seminar series with um, the CS seminar, especially. And um, so with me, I have five other faculty fellows of the CATS Center, Dr. Steve Aragon, Dr. Mustafa Fuad, Dr. Jill Keith, Dr. Tenil Prisley, and Dr. Russell Smith. So they will be having um, their, um, you know, they will be discussing their own research projects when time comes up. So the presentation, I will be starting with it and then I'll be going um, uh, through a couple of um, key items of the CAT Center. And then I'll be handing it over to the faculty fellows who will be um, discussing about their individual research topic. And then we'll be talking about how to contact or how to collaborate with the center and then we'll be ready for um, taking any questions. And feel free to stop me at any point if you have any question that cannot wait, or um, also feel free to write that in the chat window. I'm sure when I'm talking, other fellows will be taking the chat window and will interrupt me if something needs to be answered right away. So welcome you all to the um, you know, Center for Applied Data Science um, seminar. Um, this is our first seminar, as I mentioned, and we are very thrilled um, to have this center um, in the institution at Winston-Salem State University. And um, the center's basic idea is that it is an institution-wide initiative. So it is going to span all throughout the WSSU with the goal of enhancing the research and education and make some data-driven knowledge discovery. And the main theme of our center is the interdisciplinary research. So basically we wanna um, kind of like collaborate with computer scientists and the domain scientists who are experts in um, specific areas who may have tons of dat data sitting over there and need some insight from those data, but just do not know how to manipulate those data and get some insights. So we wanna collaborate with those domain scientists and then um, you know, focus on important problems. And by solving these problems, we wanna make um, some um, you know, data intensive discovery. So we have currently ongoing research projects in the areas of pharmacoengineering, mobile crowd sensing, spatial justice and social mobile mobility, healthcare management and music's biophysical influence on the human body. And each of the faculty fellow is the lead for one of those research projects. So besides um, you know, improving the uh, research and education on data science, one of our key goal is also to enhance the inclusion and diversity in the data science research and education. Our background research actually we figured out, you know, we found that um, you know, um, in today's world, data is the power and whoever has the data and has the analytic power is the richest. 
However, this benefit of data science is not equally observed across communities. So there are rural communities, there are local communities, there are ethnic communities, minorities who are not actually getting the benefits um, equally. So our um, preliminary study of a uh, education uh, um, system, you know, General um, Assembly Education Company, uh, who ran a survey in 2017, actually found that only 34% um, of women is participating in data science uh, technical fields or the courses, while the participation of in other areas, all technical areas, we are not talking about non-technical areas, of the women participation is something like 56%. And similarly, the minorities like the you know, African-American and Latinos, only 11% is actually getting some experience in data science, whereas in other fields of computing, that percentage is 18%. So clearly there is a gap over there and much needs to be done to make this uh, field of data science inviting and make it inclusive and the CAT Center will be um, you know, working toward that goal to make it uh, more appealing to the people with different background identities, experiences, and perspectives. So a little bit of history. Um, we are one of the few HBCUs who has a funded data science center. So a, a little bit of history is needed, like how actually this idea evolved and um, what happened on background. So, um, I actually started in 2017, my NSF award, uh, where I had the provision of um, recruiting a couple of WCC faculty um, across many disciplines, not only just computer science, and um, as faculty adopters. And their uh, you know, goal, the goal of that faculty adopter program is that so that they could effectively kind of like infuse the data science into their research and curriculum. So basically what we did is that we ran that program where faculty and me can collaborate, and then we can come up with some modules that is, they are going to infuse their own courses. That could, course could be um, social science, business, uh, marketing, uh, physical therapy, anything. So until 2020, okay, this collaboration effort actually impacted um, 170 WCC students and seven faculty so far uh, from computer science, management, marketing, physical therapy, and social science departments actually collaborated with me. And we came up with a um, you know, couple of modules that we teach many students and the number shows up uh, like that. So at 2019, um, one of the fellow, uh, current fellow, Dr. Smith, who was actually one of the adopter during my initial, um, you know, the faculty adopter implementation as well, we collaborated and we did received a grant, NSF award, to infuse data science into the urban studies and sustainability curriculum. So that's also boost up our energy and enthusiasm about um, kind of like broadening the participation of the data science across the university. So in 2019, I also organized a capacity building faculty workshop at WCCU. And many of you actually participated over there. And you probably remember that we are housed in a very, um, cold room of the Elba Jones building. The temperature was um, kind of like 55 or 60 because of all those, you know, air conditioning problem in the building. However, 27 part faculty um, across the university participated and we all are discussing very enthusiastically about how we can, um, you know, enforce the data science across the institution, how we can do better, um, all those things. And when, we when I ran a survey after that, uh, uh, workshop, kind of like all the participants over there agreed that um, they want to see the workshop report to be shared to the administration, WCC administration, the ideas, what we discussed over there to be implemented, regular meetings to be held, and the newly formed committee to be sustained. So that gives a lot of um, kind of like um, thinking perspective um, so that how we can get that momentum going. So in 2020, um, whenever um, I saw the opportunity for UNC ROI solicitation and data science is one of the uh, priority area over there. So I didn't even think a bit um, to kind of like propose a center under that umbrella and then collaborated with the fellows to write that grant proposal. And of course, um, you know, we get it. So we are one of the three um, awardees. The other two are East Carolina University and North um, Carolina State University. 
However, we are the only one who has a grant for a center. The other two got the grant for their research uh, projects, but the, we are the only one in this year who received the grant for the center. So here we are now about, um, you know, we have the money to, you know, um, found the center. And then we started working um, since I would say last July. So we started meeting regularly. Um, we hired our student at the end of the August. Uh, we are still going through a couple of more hiring and setting up everything, but we are, are running in full spirit. So the goals of the CAT Center, um, we kind of like started with a very specific three goals. So the number one is that we wanna uh, create a robust ecosystem. So our ecosystem should involve multiple stakeholders and stakeholders doesn't mean that people only from academia, like faculty or students, they can come from industry, they should come from non-profit organization, they should come from um, government organization, funding agencies like um, NSF, NIH, um, and then um, uh, they should come from other um, sectors as well. So local community, um, you know, even Winston-Salem State, other sectors like administration sectors or other sectors. So those stakeholders can come from anywhere, but we wanna build a robot e ecosystem where it will be partnered with many stakeholders and we are gonna make a pipeline for our students to kind of like being, um, 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 what do you call, addressed with their needs and with their career goals at every point of that pipeline. So that is kind of like the main idea, sorry, goal. The number two goal is obviously is to um, enhance the interdisciplinary research, education and outreach activities. And goal number three is to uh, study the issues related to the diversity and inclusion. As I made the point in a previous slide that there is still much to be done um, to um, increase our capability on that sector. So we want to kind of like build a model approach. So we want to do something that is going to be modeled for other HBCUs and other institutions. We want to come up with some recommendations to address these diversity inclusion issues. And then we want to um, make a contribution uh, by making a skilled workforce in the data science. So our robust ecosystem uh, you know, uh, goal start with the core organization. So how is our organization looks like? So as you can see, um, so this is our core organization means these are going to be like, um, you know, the kind of like fixed organization. And obviously as we grow more and more um, other stakeholders are going to be, you know, uh, added to this uh, organization. But um, the first thing we have the faculty fellows who are kind of like the pillar of our center. So five faculty fellows with their individual uh, research um, team. Then we are in the process of hiring a postdoctoral research associate who will be helping um, the faculty fellow and um, students and everybody else with the machine learning expertise and data science expertise. Then we have a separate group of people, um, what we call faculty adopters. An idea is the same as my NSF previous grant that I mentioned. So we'll be hiring six faculty adopters, um, recruiting, I should say, six faculty adopters each year uh, so that they can infuse the data science in their individual courses and we'll be doing the same collaboration that we did previously. We have the advisory board, which is very rich advisory board. board. Um, you can see um, Dr. Jones, um, Dr. Boykin, Dr. Bart, who are the chairs of the computer science, healthcare management, and um, the biological science departments. Then we have four colleagues from our sister universities or our neighboring universities, which is Tennessee State, um, NCANT and then Fayetteville State University and UNC Charlotte, all of whom are uh, renowned researcher in their fields. Um, then we have um, some representative program uh, officer, Dr. Gibson from Department of Education. Then we have um, Mr. Dalt, uh, who is the executive director of the Piedmont Triad Regional Council, which is a nonprofit organization. Then we have um, Ms. McKean, who is the Deputy Director of South Big Data Innovation Hub. So these um, big data innovation hubs are kind of like NSF supported um, gigantic um, hub. Um, there are four hubs nationwide and we actually fell into the South Big Data Innovation Hub and um, he is in our advisory board as well. We have the external evaluator, um, Dr. Austin, who 
uh, she, she has her own a very renowned farm to do the evaluation for such big projects. Then we have um, graduate research assistants and undergraduate research assistant as well. So, so far we were able to hire three graduate research assistants and we are able to hire seven undergraduate research assistants. And um, although they have been hired just for a month, a little bit over than a month, but they were already started to do you know, amazing things and I'm so grateful to have them in the team. So what kind of activities the center is going to support? Okay. So research is going to be our main um, theme, as I mentioned. So there will be interdisciplinary research projects and we are gonna talk about that uh, a little bit later. Besides the research, there will be a um, big component which is related to the education. In education, we are going to um, address the needs in several steps. At the very first step, we'll be running that faculty adopter program, which is going to um, enhance the students in the individual course level. So that part we can start immediately. Uh, later, sometimes next year, we are hoping to have a minor or option in data science set up so that any uh, student from any department can do a minor in data science as long as they are fulfilling the course requirements. Then one of the other goal was to establish a graduate certificate in data analytics, but thanks to Dr. Jones um, and the computer science department, we have been actually working on this certificate program for the last two years, and we were able to start it um, starting from this fall. So we already have student in the certificate program and of course, in future, we can only hope um, for this to be much more bigger. Um, our ultimate goal is to start a master's in data science at some point. I know there are a lot of um, bureaucracy and administrative things at us with that decision. So hoping to get that done as well. Another important thing we are doing as part of our education goal is to build a repository or a database for all the curriculum modules that we have built so far. So as I mentioned, I worked with the seven faculty previously. We now have much better understanding how the module should look like. And we have kind of like some template um, of the modules already established, um, you know, uh, need, fulfilling the needs for different departments. For example, whatever modules we are finding suitable for the social science department is not appropriate for the marketing or business department. So we have much better idea now what is going to be the template look like. So when a new faculty adopter join in our program, he or she only needs to take one of those template and then kind of like come up with a project for the students to do that has something to um, deal with their own major. So some data set that kind of like um, address the issues related to their own major and the questions that they will be exploring in that particular course. So this is going to be the kind of like summary of our education related um, activities. Then we are um, going to have lots of workshop tutorials and training. So starting from this next spring, uh, we are hoping to run regular workshop and tutorials on different segments of data science and machine learning and training as well, so that any faculty or students, whoever would like to participate, they can um, get some quick training. Um, our next segment or sector is innovation and incubation. So this is something interesting. So remember I mentioned that we wanna um, kind of like address the need for the student in every stage of that pipeline. So the goal for this innovation and incubation center is that some um, you know, domain experts, whoever is in the WCC community or the local Winston-Salem community can come to the center with their individual data science problems and the students by the end of year one there should be a group of students who are already proficient in running some analytics and some predictive models. So the students will be actually using their expertise in the real life problems to solve those problems uh, brought to us by the stakeholders and domain experts within our local community. So that innovation and incubation center uh, sector um, within the center will be supporting those activities. And the basic goal is to give our students some real life expertise or um, experience solving the real problems. We also partnered with the Career Development Resources, uh, sorry, Career Development Service at WSSU, which is called CDS. And we are going to partner with them and, um, you know, have some regular workshop or um, career fair or some kind of like activities that will be only um, steered toward the data science career so that students can get their, um, you know, um, help from there. 
uh, we are already in talk with the IBM Academic Initiative to set up some kind of like collaboration with them so that they uh, can tell us what exactly they want the students to do before they can they will be able to um, do an internship with them so those kind of things will be actually only doing more and more um, under the career development um, sector we'll be also doing the seminar series and annual symposium so we should have already started the regular seminar series but it is being postponed for um, covid and other issues so starting from spring um, i'm hopeful that we'll be having a regular seminar series where experts from um, all over the country, national, international, can talk to us about the data science and uh, real life problems. And we are going to have annual symposiums sometimes in spring each year, which will be a multi-day event where um, there will be like presentation, poster, uh, student competition like hackathon, then uh, panel talking about the diversity, inclusion, career fair, all those things will be happening in the annual symposium. Our last activity is K-12 outreach. So again, for building the pipeline, it is also very important that we go and address the local high school and middle school students and make them prepare and at least interested to the data science field. So we'll be also uh, running that um, to some local middle school and high school. And we are already in um, development of the modules that we can offer as a workshop to them. So this will be our, at least the beginning activities, what we proposed in our um, grant. We also have uh, the huge component, which is enhancing the diversity and inclusion. And as I mentioned, one of the few HBCU DS centers nationally, um, we have, you know, we celebrate the diversity and we have a wonderful diversity. If you look um, at our faculty fellow or the students, graduate students and undergraduate students, um, there is a wonderful diverse community over there. Uh, so we'll be keep doing that, um, you know, propagating the diversity across our own centers and whenever um, we are um, going into the local community and outreaching others as well. So our diversity is actually based on four um, strategies which are found in the literature, heavily cited in the STEM literature specifically. So focusing on themes, not just challenges, okay? combining art and engineering, or should I say science, um, encouraging storytelling and organizing exhibitions rather than competition. So we'll be enforcing all those um, strategies um, in all of our activities and try to enhance the diversity and inclusion. And as I mentioned, at least once in a year, we will be having a day long panel uh, where experts can come and talk about the diversity and inclusion specifically in the field of data science. So I'm sure all of you are wondering what is going to be our sustainability plan because the grant is only for three years, right? So once the grant is ended, how we are going to support the center. So again, we have a three, um, you know, sectors that we are heavily relying on. So partnership that we are already formed through our advisory board members and other community engagements. And we are hoping to form more partnership in the coming years with the local community and other WCC sectors as well. So that is going to be very important um, to keep us sustained. Um, we'll be relying to our partners for maintaining our, um, the, at least the level of education, the research problems, um, and many other subsectors that I just mentioned within our center um, based on this partnership. Obviously, external funding is going to be a very important um, uh, source for our sustainability. And we already have um, built into our activity and plan. Um, all the faculty lead has to um, apply for at least one external funding. And um, you know, I'm very grateful that all of our faculty fellows are really um, experienced with either maintaining NSF or NIH funding. Funding. So I'm sure that uh, we'll be done, you know, writing some wonderful collaborative proposals, and we'll be able to attract some external funding as each of us has some good track record um, about acquiring good amount of external funding. And then next is the organization support. So obviously we um, seek some support from different sector of WSSU, more specifically the computer science department, the college, the sponsored programs office and the, the provost office at WSSU will be key for us to sustain and to grow. 
So um, basically what um, this is kind of like the outline of what the center will be doing. Um, we have plenty of time at the end to take the question. I'm sure that you will be asking more specific question. But at this point, I will hand over the presentation to um, Dr. Argon um, from Healthcare Management Department. So he will be talking about his particular research um, you know, area, which he is leading in the center. And after that, Dr. Fuad um, and Mustafa Fuad and Dr. Jill Keith, Dr. Tenil Priestley and Dr. Russell Smith will be following. And then I will be taking over at the end again. So thank you very much um, uh, to you all at this point. And um, Dr. Agon, you just tell me when to move the slide, okay? Uh, you are muted, Dr. Argon. I'm sorry. Uh, good afternoon and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Debzani and Dr. Jones. And it's an honor for me to be here. I hope what I have to present is of some value to everyone listening. And I'm honored to uh, be a part of the CADS and uh, work with such dis distinguished scholars and uh, as my uh, colleague fellows. Uh, the uh, applied data problem that I'm addressing uh, within the context of the center is titled The Latent Structure of Provider-Patient Centeredness and Its Influence on Patients' Experience of Care, which is uh, a major problem in healthcare today, and uh, hospitals across the nation are being reimbursed or penalized uh, for ratings on their experience of care. Uh, I'm a, applying a large, a large data multi group structural equation modeling methods. Uh, Dr. Debzani, if you could go to the next slide. And my, the goals of this project are to first empirically determine the underlying structure or latent structure or meta structure, whatever you want to call it, of patient centeredness and its effects on patients' experience of care, evaluating the usefulness of multi group structural equation modeling as a large data analytics method, increasing diversity uh, in graduate student research skills to conduct patient-centeredness research, and generally advancing knowledge on patient-centeredness uh, through applied data uh, workshops and symposia. Next slide, please. Uh, my uh, research is guided or grounded in uh, this theory called the primary provider theory which is an evidence-based generalizable theory of how the patient-centeredness of healthcare providers affects patients' experience of care uh, in healthcare encounters. Uh, it's, a, it's a unique theory and uh, it's, uh, as far as we know, the only theory of patient-centeredness uh, in existence and it's based on principles. Uh, for example, uh, one of the principles of this theory is that it is the ethical duty of all healthcare providers, whether they be doctors, nurses, phlebotomists, x-ray technologists, chiropractors, dentists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, it's their duty to first and above all else protect the best interests of their patients as opposed to focusing on their own needs and the needs of the hospital or healthcare system or insurance company. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, I'm happy to present some preliminary information uh, regarding emergency room patients' experience of care. Uh, the purpose of this study was to challenge uh, this model, which essentially indicates that the patient-centeredness of an emergency room physician directly affects patients' experience of care and also affects the patient-centeredness of waiting time, which directly affects patients' experience of care. Uh, 
the uh, uh, this is a structural equation model and I want to point out a few things very quickly uh, in terms of its advantages uh, for applied data analytics or big data analytics. Uh, one, it's one of the few, if not only, methodology that addresses the problem of measurement error in data. Uh, measurement error is modeled out of the effects so that when you're looking at the effects between the major constructs of uh, a study, they're, dis they're uh, disattenuated in the sense there's no measurement in error in them. They represent true variance with the measurement error uh, modeled out. So again, this is a study of how the physician-patient centeredness affects patients' experience of care in emergency departments. Uh, the squares represent raw data and to use terminology that's popular in the, in the uh, popular vernacular now, uh, these larger circles represent meta, metadata or uh, data that is, uh, in mathematics, we call them factors or constructs. And uh, so these, these constructs exist mathematically and predict uh, the raw data measures that you, you see the du direction of the arrows. The other great advantage of this uh, multi-grip structural equation modeling is you can test measurement invariance, you can test directed relationships or so-called causal relationships. It informs them, it doesn't prove causality but it informs causality. Next slide, please. And here's the, uh, again, this is preliminary data. Uh, here are the standardized estimates of this study. And this model does in fact explain 81% of the variance of patients' experience of care in the emergency uh, department. That concludes my presentation, Dr. Debzani, and I look forward to any questions at the end. Thank you, Dr. Aragon. Um, Dr. Fuad? Uh, thank you, Devzani. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope you guys are, are doing good and can hear me. So before I uh, start uh, giving you a quick introduction of uh, the research area, I just want to add uh, to the um, um, overall picture of, of what Debzani did, uh, she somehow find um, uh, you know few people on campus who are very energetic. And uh, normally, I, I thought myself as very energetic, but after working with the fellows and the you know and the director for last few months, uh, you know I, I have to up my games. Yes. So uh, you know, three years from now, I'm hoping uh, uh, you know we will do something great and we will showcase, um, you know, you know, WSSU to the outside world. So um, I'm, I'm saying that, you know, um, I'm going to give you a quick introduction, as I mentioned, uh, what I'm going to do as part of this center uh, next three years. So uh, next slide. Um, so um, I, I don't know how many of you know about uh, crowd sensing. So uh, this a research area, is roughly 20 years old. So it's uh, started uh, when we uh, invented sensors uh, uh, that can uh, connect to the internet and then can talk to each other. Uh, in the last couple of years, uh, after the invention of the mobile device, um, you know, uh, this area has evolved a lot. Uh, and um, right, uh, like right now, at any moment, uh, all of us uh, on average carry somewhere between seven to 11 sensors with us at any given time. So uh, that's a lot of data that the um, cell phone uh, connects from, uh, you know, collects from us. Now, uh, I'm not talking about, uh, you know, clandestine, uh, um, um, you know, crowd sensing. Um, uh, I'm talking about legal. So where, where um, you know, uh, users volunteer, uh, uh, voluntarily provide data. Like whenever you are installing 
um, you know, iOS or Android in your uh, phone, it accepts to uh, get data out of your cell phone to improve uh, user experience and, you know, troubleshoot, um, you know, software and uh, stuff like that. So one big challenge uh, of such uh, crowd sensing is uh, the amount of data. So the two areas that I'm going to uh, work uh, directly relates to that particular, the amount of data, and I'm going to uh, investigate um, some engineering problems, some implementation problem um, of uh, such crowd sensing data. So next slide. So uh, the first area that I'm going to um, work is the redundancy management, like how we can reduce uh, the amount of data. Uh, like uh, when, you, when you think about crowd sensing, um, three people in the same uh, room sending the same data to the cloud. Uh, you know, so you are uh, using the bandwidth, you are using the space in the cloud or in the server, or whoever collecting the data of similar data. Uh, that's actually uh, is not helping uh, anyway, you know. So we, we, we want to reduce that. And one way um, you can do that, there, uh, one is uh, you can do it on the device side in, in the uh, phone itself. And one, you can do it on the server side, means in the cloud. Uh, so in the cloud, uh, in the client side, we can uh, you, uh, make the device uh, context aware where they are and uh, what, are, what are the other devices next to it. And uh, depending on that, um, the data will be adaptive. The amount of data collection would be adaptive. Uh, one approach uh, you guys already seeing uh, in, in real life is they're using it in, uh, to track uh, COVID uh, patients. So uh, like uh, just last um, week, uh, uh, state of North Carolina has released an app that you can install in your phone that will track uh, all phones around you and uh, will see whether you are close to anyone who is just been uh, you know, exposed to COVID-19. Or maybe 10 days from now, if somebody uh, you were uh, next to that person, uh, then you will be notified that, yeah, uh, that person were, uh, is exposed, so you need to take care or something. So we wanna use that particular approach, contact uh, awareness uh, to um, you know, reduce uh, the data and see how, how uh, productive that is. Uh, one way, another way we can do that is, uh, you know, having an, um, you know, dedicated sensing device. Uh, although mobile devices have a lot of sensors, uh, does a wonderful job of sensing, but it can sense a lot of different information for a particular domain. So we want to uh, see how having a dedicated sensing device might change uh, the data collection and, um, you know, um, data processing. On the server side, that means once the data is collected, uh, you can do a lot of different things. So all the big data and uh, you know analysis uh, goes over that. That's the post processing, but uh, we uh, we can also uh, utilize different uh, algorithms uh, to sample that data a uh, certain way. Uh, and uh, I'm going to look into um, you know uh, I'm, you know comparing the existing data and trying to you know uh, propose something new, something better. Uh, that might reduce the amount of data. So that's one area, which is the redundancy of the data that, uh, of sensing. Another is the privacy. So uh, if you look at uh, existing uh, approaches, all existing approaches um, mostly have a, a center point of privacy. So once the data is collected uh, on the server, they try to uh, secure it, private, uh, you know, provide privacy over there. Um, there are some, uh, you know, privacy. Uh, they don't send a specific your phone number or anything. Definitely, uh, you are not allowed to do that. But uh, you still, um, you know, the vendor can pinpoint you um, by just by looking at the data. Okay. So uh, you know, I want to investigate that area and try to um, create a uh, localized uh, data anonymization. So that means uh, that comes from the contact you know, context awareness part, you know, if, if the cell phone knows where it is uh, compared to the other device, uh, you know, you can, uh, you know, anonymize the data accordingly instead of sending your device information and uh, other, uh, other information to the, you know, central place. So 
uh, that's another area I'll be uh, working on. And uh, the last bullet point is sort of like my side project. Um, you know, I want to create sort of like an app. And uh, I talked to um, a few uh, person that was like uh, back in spring before the COVID-19 came up when we are uh, thinking about uh, writing this grant as, uh, in facilities management in, 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 in on campus. So I want to create actually an app uh, because nowadays all of our students uh, during rendition, we ask them to install uh, EAB Navigate. How can we utilize that to sense, uh, you know, as long as students give us that particular, uh, you know, permission, you know, uh, data so we can uh, manage the facilities across the campus. So, uh, you know, most uh, crowd sensing uh, research happens uh, through simulation. There are a bunch of different simulators out there, but although part of the research will be done through simulation, I wanna uh, create actually a real world application at the end, uh, three years from now, hopefully, uh, that uh, can be used hopefully in the campus and uh, make you know, WSSU student you know, experience more productive. So that's the idea I have, as Devzani mentioned, we uh, have a bunch of students. I already have one student, one of our junior has started working and he's already, um, I don't know whether he is uh, participating today, but um, he already started working a month, a little more than a month and uh, done, uh, done, you know, done wonderful work so far. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fuad. Dr. Keith, please. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. And I am actually kind of new to uh, data science, but I'm not new to drug addiction research. So just learning how to integrate the two of these is what I'm going to be doing these next couple of years, along with my undergraduate student. So um, you can go to the next slide, please. And I, I have two slides. I will tell you um, what I know, and, and if you have some questions, I'll try to answer them. But I know that we collect a lot of data from our patients. And when someone is ad addicted to drugs and they try to get some help and they go to get treatment for it, we end up collecting a lot of um, inf biological information from them. And we can compare that, their gene expression to those who are not addicted and look at the differences between the two uh, to the gene expression from the addicted person and the one who's not addicted. And all of that is already in the NCBI site, which is maintained, maintained by the federal government. So with that information, you can get the um, disease gene expression signatures, like a, like a fingerprint. And you can correlate that with the, um, gene expression from those who are on FDA approved drugs. So when you're talking about drug discovery, it takes, I think about $10 billion to bring a drug to market. That's why your drugs cost so much money, right? And um, medications cost so much or your taxpayer dollars are high to pay for these things. And so also there's the other database that looks at the gene expression of people who are on FDA approved drugs, okay? And you can correlate the signatures from both of these and look at which drugs are similar to the disease and which drugs are not similar to the disease and get a score that way. And if it's opposite, then that drug has the possibility of being a, a pharmacotherapy to help the addicted person. So right now, all of our attempts and I'd, I'd say over the last 30 years, all of our attempts to find something to wean people from uh, cocaine or from methamphetamine have failed, right? Either the drug causes the person to become even more addicted or the um, people or the addict will not take the drug because it makes them sick or because it makes them depressed. So we haven't been able to find a good drug to wean people from um, cocaine and um, addiction is costing us, I, I forget, um, I know it's in the tens of billions of dollars per year, taxpayer dollars. And of course, you know, the jail justice system. So a lot of people in jail because 
of drug-related crimes. So this would save a lot of money if we can find something to wean people from cocaine and methamphetamine. Um, and then once you find the drugs that, are, that can possibly be used, you then have to do some computer-assisted drug design or what we call molecular modeling to see how that drug interacts with the target. And um, in our case, is the dopamine transporter because that's, that's the um, protein responsible for addiction. Um, and you can go to the next slide. Thank you. And so this is the computer assisted drug design. Uh, we call it CAD actually. So hey, look, it matches CADs, right? Uh -huh. Anyway, I'm cor it's corny, it's corny, I know. <laughs> but um, so what you would do is you would take the drug um, that, that we find to be um, approved, that, that's already FDA approved, and you see how well it matches with the active site of the protein. So the, the lines that you see there that are swirl, like spiral, that's a protein. And then the hexagon shape, I don't even know how to describe that. That's the, um, the drug molecule. And you can see how it's interacting with the protein and why it binds tightly to that. So we can see if it's going to be an effective drug, um, partly from computer assisted drug design. But we also have to do the in vitro and in vivo test. But at least it's already approved by the um, FDA so that you don't have to spend billions of dollars with all of the toxicity studies and clinical trials bringing a drug to market. And um, like I said, I, this, I, this I know more about than I know about data science, but I'm willing to learn and I'm excited about, about it and working with everybody. And I think that that's all I have to say. I have one undergraduate just bringing her up to speed. It's a lot, you know, reading the literature, getting them used to reading the literature. But um, I do believe that she, she'll um, be able to share what she's learned. And then I have two other students who are going to help with the different aspects of um, computer assisted drug design. And I think that that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kate. Dr. Chrisley, please. All right, good afternoon. So I'd like to thank Dr. Deb for creating such a fantastic and fabulous team. It is really awesome and very exciting to be working with my colleagues on this project. Very similar to what Dr. Keith said, the field of data science is also very new for me as well. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is more so what I'm comfortable with. And then like Dr. Keith said, the data science aspect again is it's a context that is very new for me, but I'm also in the process of learning it. So my focus is using data science methods to elucidate music's biophysical influence on the body. And very often people will negate or ignore the fact that the body is basically one huge electrical circuit. And so with that, we have a lot of different stimuli that will influence and impact us on a day-to-day -day basis. And so the stimuli that our project wants to focus on is music. So you can go to the next slide. So the project overview is to employ data science to develop a predictive model for identifying the body's response to various genres of music, such as hip hop, gospel, rhythm and blues, country, reggae, and even noise. So one of the deficits within the literature is the simple fact that the, a lot of the studies, they lack diversity when it comes to the participants that are involved in the different projects, as well as lacking diversity as it relates to the music. Very commonly, people will very typically use either some type of classical or jazz music. So being that one of the focuses with this center is to promote diversity and inclusion, and especially being at a HBCU, one thing that this project is really focusing on is some of the aspects or some of the types of music that a number of our students very commonly listen to. The other piece to this is, like some of my colleagues mentioned, they are, they've addressed or they're including a number of data sets. But for us, one unique thing that we're having to do because a number of these things are lacking, we're going to have to more or less create our data sets and then use this to help establish and provide our actual model. So with this, distinctions of instrumental versus lyrical music across these genres will be addressed based upon age, race, gender, and so forth. 
And with this, what we've kind of seen in a different project that I have is that the body responds to instrumental music slightly different than it does with lyrical music. And there's also variations as it relates to these aspects of age, race, and gender. So the biophysical parameters that we will be looking at are blood pressure, heart rate, power output, workload, and then skin conductivity. Skin conductivity is really one of those aspects of basically an emotional response, but that emotional response is ultimately connected to um, the electrical activity within the actual body itself. So the whole idea with this is we want to establish this particular model to see if, you know, like individuals will exhibit similar parameters across the board. So for example, let's say you have an African-American female and let's say a Caucasian male, they have two different ages, but they listen to the same aspect of music or the same type of music, would they exhibit or demonstrate the same exact parameters? So our goal again is to basically create a data set and then create this predictive model so we can look at those particular aspects. So that's all that I have for this project. Thank you, Dr. Prisley. Um, Dr. Smith, please. Great, thank you. Good to see everybody this afternoon. Uh, keep mine short and sweet. I'm, I'm at the end of the, end of the role here. So uh, my project builds on some work that I've been doing with the Spatial Justice Studio at CDI that we've had for three years now. And uh, Dr. Deb and I have explored uh, tentatively some of this issue. And this was an opportunity to work together uh, more formally and to also try to include some students in the development of a spatial justice index for North Carolina communities. So if you're not familiar, spatial justice refers to the general access to public goods, basic services, cultural goods, economic opportunity, and overall healthy environments. So it's an all encompassing term that has, it's, that's relatively new in, in, in terms of the, the jargon and the literature, but um, you know, it's been around in forms for centuries. Uh, we're all familiar with spatial inequalities that exist across our landscapes. Spatial justice is trying to focus on how do we rectify those situations? How do we make places, spaces, as a geographer and a former planner, more just? And my thought is if we can quantitatively uh, examine where places exist in one moment in time, you can then begin to compare and contrast and identify what are the needs of individual communities. So that's the goal of this project. The other thing um, I just want to mention is that most to date, almost all uh, research around spatial justice has focused on either theoretical understandings of spatial justice and or case studies. So not a lot of quantitative analytical and that's where the data science uh, piece comes in. So next slide, please. So the research focus is really trying to come up with a methodological approach to measure spatial justice, injustice, depending on the situation. As I mentioned, the literature focuses on theory, qualitative discussions, case studies, but we're looking to quantitatively explore and develop a spatial justice index that can then be used to compare uh, census tracts, in this case, in North Carolina as a starting point. Um, we're going to hopefully utilize a combination of both spatial geographic variables as well as quantitative um, attributes of spaces within census tracts to create an index for cross-community comparison. Uh, the activities that we're going to have to undertake to do this is exploring the features and attributes that most, cor most closely correlate with spatial justice, and that in itself is an issue because there's not really one un uh, unified, agreed-upon definition of what is spatial justice? What does spatial justice look like? Because it encompasses so many things. So we're, we're doing some um, analysis in terms of what are some of the key variables that are even going to go into determining a just place. We have to, of course, identify and collect data sets related to this, build a machine learning module uh, to hopefully provide more meaningful insight into the index. Uh, the proposed research aims to leverage, again, I think the key here is a combination of geographic information technologies, system technologies, um, and also the data science side of things uh, to explore these variables at the census track level. Uh, the goal is, of course, if we can create an index that works in communities here in North Carolina, that would be replicable to larger scales as well as smaller scales across the country. Uh, the research findings will be applied in the context of North Carolina data sets to evaluate its effectiveness and really begin a discussion on does, does, is it possible to measure spatial justice? 
Um, I can tell you there has been numerous studies done on individual levels of spatial injustices, a lot of research quantitatively on environmental justice impacts, um, but nothing that's tried to encompass the wide range of spatial injustices that we propose with this, um, this research project uh, across everything from transportation, economics, recreation facilities, um, as well as health, education, the environment. So really trying to create a all encompassing index uh, for these communities that I outlined earlier. So thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to discuss my project and I'm looking forward in three years to having something to, to share with you. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Um, so um, as you heard all the faculty fellows, you must realize that they all have you know, very important problems. There is a lot of data associated with it, but they may not have the data science expertise. So that's where I will be coming and the uh, newly appointed postgraduate research associate will be coming handy. So we have the expertise to analyze the data. We have the expertise to build the predictive models. And by those collaborative efforts, we are hoping to, um, you know, have some uh, significant results at the end of the three year. So I'm sure that you are all having some questions. I saw a lot of faculty and students um, in the meeting. So I'm sure that everybody is, um, you know, wanting, like thinking about how we can help or at least collaborate. So um, anytime, if you see any research problems um, that needs to explore the data and you do not know how to proceed with it, you can discuss it with the center. And if our, uh, we have enough resources, we'll be gladly help you out. Um, I am already hearing from, uh, you know, the um, uh, colleagues across the campus about, okay, this data set I'm looking for, do you know anything about this kind of data sets? And I was able to help that. Um, some other, um, you know, queries I'm also receiving. So I'm glad to um, support those colleagues, uh, whoever is in need of looking for a particular data set or looking for how to enhance their models or everything. Second thing you can do um, that inspire your student to take the opportunity of the graduate certificate program, which I just mentioned started in fall 2020, and there will be another new uh, uh, group in fall 2021. So that will be an excellent opportunity for the people who are already graduated. And whenever the minor and uh, master's program is in place, um, you know, please advise your student to be enrolled to them. Uh, faculty adductor award, I mentioned there will be six that will be recruiting this year, every year actually. And the solicitation will be advertised very shortly within one week or two. So keep an eye for that and then apply and um, try to infuse the data science as your course modules. As I mentioned, the process is much more streamlined now. So um, I'm looking for the collaboration over there. Uh, participate in seminars on annual symposium. And um, the center always welcome any opportunity for community engagement. So if you see that uh, there is a um, opportunity for the center to do any community improvement or just address some need in the community, please reach to us. Um, we'll be more than happy to um, support. Uh, for the students, um, we still do not have a designated space. I know that the provost office is working hard to find us a space. So once we have a space, we welcome all the students to visit us regularly to know about the uh, center activities, to participate in the training workshop, to um, you know communicate with other center um, employee students like the GRA and um, UGRS, uh, participate on the hackathon or um, incubation program. So you know just come and. Um, you know, uh, just uh, be there with us whenever everything is in place. And I'm hoping that will be sooner, uh, like this spring. Uh, lastly, uh, how to contact us. So we have a email address. We have a center website at WCCU. So this is the link of the website. Um, um, let's see, okay, this is in my other uh, slide actually open, uh, other monitor, so I cannot show you guys right now. But um, the LinkedIn page is, you can also see that we have actually a LinkedIn page and you can go there, uh, see our post, you can communicate over there with us and, um, you know, all of our uh, activities will be shared both in the um, WCC website and the LinkedIn web page as well. So be there with us and we welcome any kind of like engagement. Any question? Uh, I have a question, uh, Dr. Deb. I, I would like to ask Dr. Presley if, if I could be one of her first subjects. 
she can bombard me with music and see if there's any effect. I'd, I'm really serious about this and I'd like to volunteer. Dr. Aragon, you know that I'm gonna come and get you. You're right across from me. I think we all have to be her guinea pig at the first time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So any question, anyone, please. Are we muted or? No, you're fine. It was just explained so thoroughly that no one has any questions. I, I would, uh, Dr. Fodd's study is so interesting and uh, I heard him say he wants to reduce data, which uh, I'm involved with a little bit in the stuff I do in measurement, reducing data to larger variables mm. that actually cause the smaller variables. And, uh, but I was wondering, is there, when all the, the massive amount of data you collect, Dr. Fod, is it, uh, what is the metric associated with it or the scale? Is it like binary ones and O's or? Uh, it, it depends on, on the, you know, application, you know, how they're saving the data in. Eventually it's everything is zero one but it depends on the type of data. So okay. uh, it depends on, on the application to application. Thank you. Yeah, yeah this is Mac, I have a question. Okay. Yes. Uh, the data that you're keeping, are you planning to combine that into one central data source managed by one location or each individual uh, project component basically managing their own? specific data, data set. So I can take that one. So right now, uh, you know, as you heard from the faculty fellows, like some of them will be collecting data, some of them will be actually working with already established data. So it is our goal ultimately to come up with our own repository where we can, you know, kind of like post all the data that the, at least the fellows are working with or at least they collected. And if there is no um, uh, permission issues, like I know that a lot of the healthcare management data you have to de-identify and then only can release. So after uh, doing all those protocols, it is our goal ultimately to have our own um, data repository so that um, anyone can come and kind of like, you know, work on those data sets. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Good question. We'd like to thank everyone for coming to this seminar today and we look forward to the work that's coming from this group. Please watch for our November seminar. We'll send an invitation and we look forward to seeing you with us then. Thank you very much, Dr. Jones. Yeah. Um, from me and for all the center fellows and uh, excellent students as well and everybody in the center personnel. Thank you very much yeah. for inviting us. Thank you, Doc. Our pleasure. Is it too late for a question? I'm no, I uh, another one. question. Uh, yes, uh, hello, I'm Antonio Daniels, a senior computer science student. Mm -hmm. And it was going off of the past question about with the date on the data collected from for um, medical reasons. I've recently been doing some assignments about confidentiality. So how would that go about been releasing that kind of data to for everyone to look at afterwards once uh, everything's been collected or when everything has already been collected? I'd like to make a quick comment about my data. My data represents the judgments of patients regarding their healthcare providers for their retrospective judgments after they receive service. And then they evaluate their healthcare providers. Is that, uh, are you interested in that kind of data? I'm asking the questioner. Uh, yes, any data that has anything to do with confidentiality having, being released so anybody can see. I remember somebody just said, like it has to go through um, identification, like, so yeah. that yeah. It, um, the whoever was, whoever the data came from, they really can't be identified if it's something sensitive. 
So how would um, uh, the data go? Uh, sorry, how would you go about releasing that kind of data? Yeah, I, I got my data from a uh, national firm that collects patients' evaluations of their hospitals and their healthcare providers and services. And I had to make a special request for it. And I had to justify getting the data. And then they agreed to give it to me for the purposes for which I proposed using it. And they de-identified everything before they sent it to me. Uh, there, there are laws, uh, HIPAA laws, health insurance, something policy act that uh, govern the release of data in healthcare. So any, like hospital, for example, that has data, it can't release data and it has to, unless it's de-identified and unless uh, it receives uh, approval for release from the executives of the hospital. So basically all the identification information like name, birth date, or anything that you can identify you being you has to be removed before the data has to be released to you. Does this make sense, Antonio? Uh, yes, thank you. Good question. Yep, that's very important questions, right? Yeah. We want to do so much in the healthcare and medical side, but um, the data, getting the right data is really, really difficult sometimes. Even at the, uh, not only at the local level, but even at the hospital level. Some hospitals don't want their data, they don't want to be identified with their own data. It's very interesting. <laughs> mm. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Be careful. Oh, yes. Bye. Same to everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Mm -hmm.